the participants coming to the meeting. Good afternoon. My name is Emilia Janisz. I'm a director of strategy of the European Nuclear Society, and I have a great pleasure to welcome you today to a special webinar which we kick off the series of webinars that we organize monthly at ENS. Uh, the first webinar of this year, 2023, is organized together with Framatom. We have a great speaker from Framatom, and the title of this webinar is Recent Developments in Fuel Services Equipment, How to Customize the Service Solutions for Your Plant. Uh, today we have a speaker, Thomas Wiese. Uh, he's Framatom Head of Fuel Services Europe. Uh, located in Erlangen, and uh, Thomas will show you how the Framatom solutions meet the ongoing development of fuel assemblies and core components, as well as the evolving requirements for safe plant operations and the commissioning requiring customized solutions of detection and inspection, examination and techniques. And Thomas is uh, ready to answer afterwards after his presentation your questions so please use the chat box uh, put your questions and we will select the most interesting one have a nice listening of the webinar thank you thomas floor is yours yeah emilia thank you very much so first of all i will start the presentation which should be Visible now for everybody. Does it work? Okay, cool. Yeah. Welcome, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name is Thomas Wiese. I am the head of the Framatom Fuel Services team, which is located in Erlangen. Um, first of all, thank you all for participating to this webinar, and especially many thanks to Emilia and Mattia for, for the support for organizing that. Uh, and for sure, um, thanks to the ENS for the organization in total, but also thanks to the team and the management inside Erlangen and the Framatom. So, yeah, I would like to give you a short background first. So why are we here today? Our job is to ensure a safe and hopefully boring energy production. So why boring? Because boring means a stable plant operation and especially a low impact on public opinion on nuclear energy, which is good for us. But talking about safety, I would like to give just a, let's say, sh short message. So if, if I look outside, um, it reminds me that safety is implemented on a very high level in our work, but I really encourage you, please, consider your private safety at home for you and your family and your friends and so on, because it's winter in Europe. In Germany, it is snowing right now. So it's wet, it's cold, it's windy, maybe icy. So please take care of yourself. But okay, coming back to the boring energy production again, small items and incidents can have a significant impact on our daily business and especially future planning. I think you all know of that. So if you look now on the presentation, you can see just a small paper clip and these small paper clip can have a rather huge incident, even though it is a small item at the first place. So this paper clip you see here, and this is a story I would like to tell you today. The story about the paper clip is that it has a huge impact on plant operation. So this clip was actually found in the core vessel at the bottom and it caused a significant wall breakthrough of the one rod you see on the left, where you can see here that the fission gas was released, but it also caused severe fretting marks on the other one. And what I would like to show you today, following this story, the recent developments we made inside the Framatom to treat the huge impact of such a small paper clip. But first of all, I think it's also necessary that you know who we really are and what we do. To give a short introduction about that, we are inside the Framatom, we are a global acting fuel services team in Lynchburg, Lyon and Erlangen with more than 120 service experts, which are sharing technology, equipment and resources. We are located in the US, we are located in France, in Germany, we have controlled areas, we have short mobilization times and so on. And I have the pleasure to be the, the representing head of the field service of the Erlangen team. 
what we are all doing in the field services in the Framatome is we are strongly aligned to do everything which is necessary to deal with this paperclip event, which is starting from the fuel delivery when it comes to the design of the equipment of, of the fuel assemblies to improve their design, um, going over to supply of service equipment for inspections, measurements, repairs, and so on. We are doing visual inspections, on-site examinations. We are performing measurements like dimension, oxide, and so on. But coming back to the paper clip, we are detecting leaking fuel assemblies, fuel rods, using sipping and ultrasonic testing. And after that, we do everything which is necessary to either bring back the fuel assembly into plant operation or for final disposal by repair, but also performing sampling operations to do characterization and going down the back end story um, we are also performing encapsulation and prepare the the spent fuel for final disposal so what we are doing is we are covering the whole life cycle of the fuel assembly from the very beginning to the very end and all of that to deal with a paper clip okay so far for the introduction in general i would like to present not only technologies, but also developments and processes which are related to the topics you see here. But I will also do some sidesteps out of the topics. Um, if you have any questions, please write them down and we do a question and answers round after the presentation. So first of all, coming back to the paperclip, the story starts with an increased radioactivity background in the reactor coolant. And here we can support, beside the fuel service topics, with a detailed radiochemical water analysis to provide some kind of leaker prediction as accurate as somehow possible based on the data we get. For example, to estimate fuel type, the burn up, or maybe also the fuel assembly cycle to support analysis to find the leaker and especially to prepare the mass sipping. So, the first step you have to do for sure is to find uh, to perform a leaker detection for the paper clip. So, um, how does mass sipping work? I will not go into the very, very, very details of the equipment, but it is necessary necessary to explain it a little bit. So, first of all, the principle of the mass sipping relies on the pressure relief outside the fuel rod caused by lifting the fuel assembly itself, for example, out of the core. And this pressure relief is then driving the isotopes, which are inside the rod, either in the gaseous phase or in the, in the liquid, to go outside into the water. The Framato mass sipping method we are applying is now a little bit different um, from what is available on the market. We are not analyzing gas, which is directly sucked out of the mast, we are extracting the water out of the mast. So how to do that? To achieve a higher accuracy and sensitivity for the mast sipping, the water in the vicinity of the fuel assembly inside the mast, directly at the position of the fuel assembly, is sucked into a separate degasifier in our equipment. And then the gas inside, inside this water, which is going into the degasifier, is extracted by stripping and sent to better detectors. And this whole operation is done during the unloading process, for sure, but without any holding time for the loading machine. And since this technology is known and applied since decades without, few, uh, without fail during usual outages, the question is, Surely, what is the improvement here? Yeah, what have we done? We have enhanced the degassing firing principle inside the mass sipping equipment, reducing the size and the weight of the degassifier itself, and also making several internal components of the equipment, such as water pumps, level controller, vacuum pumps, drying cartridges, and so on, no longer necessary, so we do not need them anymore. And in parallel with improving this degasifier inside our equipment, the, um, the degasifying factor has been increased by a factor of 1.5.
And consequently, because we are degasifying more, increasing the sensitivity of our def uh, detectors also by the factor of 1.5. So the very sensitive Framato massiving equipment, which was proven and successfully used in the past, is now improved by a factor of 1.5 related to the detection principle itself. The new degasifier from a mechanical standpoint also is easy to extract and to maintain, which is now reducing the dose rate of the possible to also tackle the this safety aspect because we can take it out of the equipment and replace it by a new one. It's rather small, it's easy, it, it's lightweight. So you have a significant safety impact also. And due to the reduction of all the components, you can see it on the pictures here, it was also possible to reduce the size of the equipment, making, the, uh, making it much more easier for you to handle. So. As you see, the relation between the new equipment and the former equipment on the picture is really significant, making it more easier for you. But also the robustness of the controlling system and the sipping process itself is increased because we have less components inside to be monitored and controlled. Um, but this new development, which is significant, which is really a differentiator here, is no change of the mass sipping principle itself. So still we rely on pressure relief, still we rely on degasifying and better detection. So what does that now mean for you as a customer? You have a higher safety because those rate can, can be reduced. You have a higher robustness and you have an increased reliability due to these increased sensitivity. So this new mass sipping system with these new degasifying principle is clearly a di differentiator for us compared to our former technology. Okay, so now we found the leaking fuel, which was caused by the paperclip with our mass sipping equipment. And now we need to evaluate the fuel assembly situation by visual inspection. So what have we done? First of all, Improved cameras and recording systems lead to increased issue, decreased, sorry. And, uh, no, sorry again. In the past years and also decades, the camera systems and the recording systems have been improved very much. But especially the data treatment is not treated in the right way and the efficiency of the data collection itself on site is a, is a real challenge. The, the file size are getting bigger. You get much more pictures. When we have performed in the past sensitive inspections on fuel assembly, sometimes you have like 200 pictures per fuel assembly or even more. And you need to treat all that. All these pictures and videos, they need to be entitled in the right way to be able to track what we have inspected afterwards. So the following equipment, what I would like to show you is technically not so complex, but it is severely improving the inspection and data treatment independently of the used camera system. So what have we done? Based on the field service experience of decades, we have developed the user interface of the data collection to easily collect and compile the inspection data right during performing the inspection. You can see it here in the, in the lowermost region that in the interface itself, you can pick the fuel assembly, you can pick the face you are inspecting, the rod, the position, what you see. And when you save the picture, all this data is immediately included in the, in, in, in the, in the file itself. And you can afterwards easily track what you have done. This new interface combined with the equipment is called ViperS. So it's a result of a cooperation with our customers. And it is also already in use by us. We have like five or six equipments of that, but also by our Swiss customers, not only for fuel service purposes, they are also using these equipment, the ViperS for, for other inspections in the core and so on. So the, the advantage of the Viper, the video picture entitling and recording system, I, I love this name, the advantage of the Viper is that you can fed it, you can feed it with any kind of video signal. So it's totally independent of the camera system you are using. You can put up to four video signals inside in parallel, and it is compatible to almost all of the available equipments on the market. So we are combining it with, a, for example, with a Diacont um, camera equipment. 
And the next step of the Viper, which is already a very enhanced data collecting and collecting and recording system is to combine the Viper during visual inspection with a visual analysis based on artificial intelligence. So here it is really important to say, we are currently in customer cooperation to combine these artificial intelligence with a visual inspection online, but in no scenario of the world, it is intended to replace the operator and the quality control because this is required by quality assurance system. I was asked by a customer whether we can have this inspection fully automated. Um, I think this is not the path one should go. So the, the target of this development now is to support the on-site crew, crew to reduce the human performance impact, but also providing an enhanced documentation using the Viper S in the background. So, where are we in this development? Currently, we are developing several development paths using either artificial intelligence or machine learning. And we are in close cooperation with the three customers to make sure that the final product fits best to your needs. So we will keep you informed about the development here and about the process. And the, the target is that we put this product to put this um, artificial intelligence support combined with a Viper in front of you as soon as possible. But what we can say right now, and you can see it here on the picture, that it's working already. It's now just a question of user interface. Okay, so you found the leaker caused by the paperclip. You found it with mass tapping. You the leaker has been inspected using the Viper S supported by this artificial intelligence interface. The root cause is clear, it is a paperclip. And now the paperclip needs to be removed. Yeah, debris removal is something which is easy and it is very complex. In parallel, debris you have in the fuel assembly, they always tend to move and change their position during your extraction approach. So you now have two possibilities to react on the debris. Either you provide many simple equipments, like you can see here on the picture, many simple equipments to deal with the various scenarios of the debris and the various uh, positions and sizes and so on. Or on the other hand, you provide one complex equipment, which is very flexible to be adapted. And what have we have done, what Framatome has done in the past years is we have developed inside Framatome both strategies. So on one hand, we have further enhanced our stock of individual grippers, pincers, clamps, suction devices, filters, and so on. Like you can see on the picture with a very simple and easy and lightweight uh, sucking, suction devices, mobile grippers, electrical grippers, uh, and so on. But also on the other hand, we have the proven and advanced five axis Pelican robotic arm. And you can see it here on the right picture um, with a 3D um, digital picture and um, uh, some tests, which has already proven a very safe debris extraction because it is supported by a force and camera surveillance. And the, the, the head of the Pelican itself, you can apply different grippers. It can turn in different axes. So when you want to extract debris and the debris is changing its position or it is in a very complex position or you need uh, uh, force surveillance, Pelican is the right tool for that. And for sure, all those operations supported by either the Viper and advanced cameras, uh, not either, supported by the Viper and advanced camera system to ensure a comprehensive documentation. So you can see here at the Pelican, for example, there are two cameras, one for detailed inspection and one for the overall camera surveillance. And all these equipment are mobile and can be adapted to the customer specific purpose. Okay, coming back to the story. Now you have removed the paper clip, so the fuel assembly has to be repaired. So 
pulling a rod or detecting it by means of eddy current or ultrasonic, such as a Framatome Echo 330. I think this is this is uh, commonly known, usually known. I, I will not go into the very details of a few rod extraction and detection and so on. I would like to step a little bit out of the story and talk about the structural repairs. Um, which could also happen by a debris, but most likely not by a paper clip. So the, the Framatome Fuel Service has performed more than 100 structural fuel assembly reconstitutions in the past 10 years, leading to a wide range of potential applicable equipment for use. So I will shortly try to sum it up in a little bit detail what kind of equipment is meant. So. First of all, we have developed a very sensitive, manually driven five axis grinding, cutting, drilling table for rather huge decommissioning and cutting operations. You can see it on the on the right bottom here. Um, behind these, it looks like a, a saw with a grinding disc. Behind these discs, there is a manual driven table where you can position underwater, where you can position these grinding discs in any orientation you need. Um, so, the why is it manually driven? Because the surveillance of the Iron Sea and the risk management is extremely easy like this. So you have no switches, you have no complex Iron Sea, and so on. Um, we also have developed lightweight grinders and cutters, which are shown in the left bottom, and to, to replace or to smoothen um, or to cut small pieces and also treat debris. We have as an additional technology, uh, we are using additive manufacturing. We, have, uh, we are using to either replace spacers for final disposal or put uh, spacer segments, you can see it right here, or also to put uh, corner sleeves. And uh, one of the most interesting topic here is that we are using have used additive manufacturing to completely replace a spacer which was more or less missing. You can see it on the top right. It's a boiling fuel where this spacer on top, which is almost not possible to be seen anymore, had to be replaced for final disposal. And the fuel assembly was this corner sleeve on the top left was reinserted into the, the core again. So to sum it up, whatever challenge you have when it comes to reconstitution, we may have the answer. But now stepping back down further on the disposal path, you have to uh, retrieve the debris, you have replaced the rods, you have changed maybe some components, and now you have to dispose it. So to know what you have in the pool, you need to perform sampling not only on the fuel assembly, but also on other components. And due to the phase out and disposal preparation all over Europe, um, we performed sampling operation, not only on fuel assemblies, but also on almost all kind of core components. So what we have developed here, and this is a most interesting part on this slide is that we have developed the mobile equipment to cut RCCA fingers, TPA fingers and poison rods, instrumentation lenses and so on to collect small pieces of such core components, but we have also taken samples of spacer grids. You can see it in the in the middle right. Here we have drilled a small piece out of the, the spacer. We have taken hold down spring uh, samples. We drilled into the um, guide samples. It's a top left picture. We have taken samples of the water, uh, water channel of a boiling fuel um, and also of the uh, boiling fuel assembly channel itself. But also we have taken samples of the cladding of a burnt rod without fully cutting the rod. In the uh, left middle picture, you can see that we have cut out of this rod a sample of the cladding, which is now laying here in this uh, small containment um, to reduce the sample you have to send to the hot labs to the most reasonable and most possible small size. And this is reducing for you the transport cost. OK. The fuel assembly is prepared. It's ready for either disposal or for operation. Um, and some when finally you have to send the fuel assembly to a cask. And some regulators require for the cask 
loading a proof that your repair has been successful and there is no defect anymore. So you have to perform a box zipping right in advance of transport loading to uh, avoid that you have these water content criteria of the cask that it is jeopardized. So regarding this cask loading, you have a, a real challenge with the long stored fuel. If you look on the decay of the fission products over time, um, you can see that the gaseous fission products like xenon and krypton, some when they are decayed. So you cannot rely on gas samples anymore. So you cannot really rely on pressure relief and analyzing the gas because the reliability you get, if you look on the top left picture, reliability on taking such samples over time is not 100% anymore. And also over time, the heat decay of the fuel assembly is not sufficient anymore to drive out the fission products. And this is a time of the Framatome box zipping with heating. This equipment was developed in 1978. I wasn't even born. And it was sold all over the world and it never failed, neither operated by Framatome personnel nor by customer personnel. And in 2019, we decided to take these box zipping equipment with heating which is fixed installed in the plants and make it available on mobile. So the development you see here on this picture on the top left in the 3D picture um, is not the development of the box zipping with heating, it's the development of various mobile version. What you see here is a mobile configuration we have manufactured for us. So this equipment you can see here is designed to withstand an earthquake while it is sitting on a volcano. So it is important to mention here that this equipment here, we need to develop, to develop it for us, that it fits to all of you. Whereas if you want your own equipment, we can customize it down, shrink it down and make it more easy to handle. Um, what is important here to say that besides these seismic conditions, which we are trying to treat with these anti-seismic stand, this as uh, a box zipping equipment itself is totally safe from a safety standpoint. No dry out is possible because the box itself, it is open at the bottom and at the upper top. So as I said, orange is a box zipping, blue is the anti-seismic stand, which can be customized. Um, we have different configurations here. You can just take the box zipping equipment and install it fixed in the pool in a single or double box version, which is for us the standard config configuration of the Siemens or KWU plants. You can choose a mobile installed version of just the orange pieces, for example, installed in the new fuel elevator. This is the suggested standard configuration for the new EPR to come but it's also currently in manufacturing for the new builds in the UK. Um, or finally, you take the mobile and standalone version, um, which has no impact on civil works in the plant, which you can put in the cask position in the pool. Um, the equipment you can see here right now um, will be in operation in August. Had a customer who had uh, who was confronted with uh, several defect casks, so he had to unload the cask again and now to perform box zipping because when he was preparing the cask operation, um, this equipment was not available. So, but to not forget about the paperclip story, what do we do with the rod now? So here is a topic. This is not an equipment, but it is for me, it is a development which is really important for me to mention. We were allowed to clean up several canisters and pools of several plants and discovering, or let's say being faced with the fact that there were some what I call old and dead bodies in the pool. So in the past five years, we have moved more than 800 of severely damaged rods and have treated them leading to what I call a defect furot management process, which we recommend for any future defects. Because during this treatment of these 800 grots, we were confronted with missing data, not knowing what we will have when we open up the canisters, uh, or we didn't even know where the fuel was coming from and so on and so on. So what is important to say here on the defect furot management is that it is very 
important that you collect as many data as soon as you can and that you prepare the rod as much as you can in advance. And the earlier the final pass of the, the disposal of the rod is known, the better. And this is reflected by these process steps here. We recommend to start first before you touch the rod, which is in your canister, to perform historical data analysis. And based on that, you sort out everything which is sufficiently described because you know what you have. Then in the second step, you perform inspections and measurements and on suspect rods you still have. Then you sort out again those where you have sufficient data. And finally, in the third step, you treat the sensitive ones which are broken, which are in fragments or any remainders. And you can see on the top left that we have uh, tools for that. Here you can see a broken rod which was inserted into a capsule using a funnel. Um, all of that just to avoid that you do not just put the rod into a quiver or a canister. And this approach was well applied in the past. And once you have done all of that and you know what kinds of rods you have, they are pre-treated and you have all the documentation, you can go further with uh, uh, step number four with uh, the final encapsulation. Yeah, shortly talking about encapsulation, Framer Thomas decided to go down the path of the most safe approach of the furat encapsulation. Our facility and all the process is located underwater, separated rod by separating rod by rod in this process. So whatever can happen will never ever have an impact on the safety of the plant. And also the proof of the water content inside the capsule is broken down on a rod by rod case and not on a bunch of rods or a, a canister case. And this process has been proven and was safely applied in Belgium and will be followed up in the future. So I think the story about the paper clip is finished. We have detected the fuel assembly with the enhanced mass sipping with the new degasifying system. We inspected it using the Viper and artificial intelligence. We have removed the debris using the Pelican. We found the fuel rod using Echo and repaired the fuel assembly. We analyzed the residuals. We performed the cask loading after approval by the mobile box zipping, and the defect furad was encapsulated. And now I would like to show you in the remaining time two further technologies which are very interesting, but which do not deal with these paperclip story. The first one is the RCCA testing equipment. So since many years, Framatome is applying eddy current testing on RCCAs uh, on all plants where the regulator requires uh, requirements allow us to break down the RCCA lifetime management on very simple data. We have developed this equipment further to also measure the average cladding diameter. So it's a combination of eddy current testing to detect cracks but also measure wear marks and swelling in percent on a, and to define the diameter increase in degrees. The whole measurement itself, the measurement time depends only on refueling machine speed. The calibration, you can see it here on the picture, the calibration stand, the calibration can be performed in dry and not in a complex stand underwater. And the measurement head you can see here can be placed in any fuel assembly position, like for example, the fuel elevator or the storage rack. And the usual measurement time we have, depending on loading machine speed is about eight to 10 minutes. So because it's so fast, we perform at those customer a full RCCA, full core RCCA measurement within approximately one to one and a half shifts. And since many years, this rather easy approach of the customer uh, at our customers allows them to reduce their outage time and perform a sustainable RCCA lifetime management. So some of our customers have RCC8, which are far beyond 15 years of operation. And why am I mentioning that? This solution now, including since a few years, the, also the, the diameter measurement is not only sustaining safety, it is especially and very much environmental friendly as you are bringing down your waste. 
for sure, other technologies based on ultrasonic testing, which are more complex, provide much more data. So you always need to check with your regulator, is it allowed to bring down the complexity of the data, which is currently forcing you to measure as less as possible because the impact on the outage is so big, because you have to long measurement times using UT and so on. So the fact is with the, uh, with the equipment you see here is we are fast, we get a minimum of data needed, but, the, but we measure everything. We measure all the RCCAs in a very fast time. Okay, and just for a short overview, the equipment itself is more or less fully automated. And you can see here an overview on the interface. Um, you have online providing you the measurement results right when the RCCA is in the refueling machine. You can see here an 18 by 18 RCCA um, with a one rod with the measurement data you have in the lowermost section, you have an overview of all the rods with, uh, with wear marks, the position and so on and so on. And you get an immediate print out which you can judge and then you can go further for the next RCCA. Okay, talking about RCCAs, finally, last equipment. What you see here is our newest, and I can say it, I have not developed it, also smartest and patented development. What you see here, the Framatum DC3, the device for core component cutting, is our answer on a fast, easy, and flexible decommissioning operation, which you can execute not only after plant shutdown, but maybe also during plant operation already. The DC3 is a core component cutter, which is applicable not only for RCCAs, you can see here on the top left in, in red, uh, uh, typical Siemens RCCA, but also the uh, 17 by 17 and 15 by 15, um, how many RCCAs fit inside, but also any other um, RCCA design because it's totally independent of the uh, uh, manufacturer of the RCCA. Um, we can cut TPAs, we can cut instrumentation tubes, poison rods, whatever you have, which is tube sized with a more or less small tube um, diameter. But how does it work? The DC3 contains inside this housing, it contains a turning disc, which is driven by these four pistons you see in the surrounding. So it's, uh, it's just turning by 90 degrees. And while the disc is turning, the fingers of the RCCA, of the TPA, the poison rod, or even just one single rod is cut into pieces, falling down below the DC3. In parallel, while cutting, the, the disc itself is sealed that any residuals of the cutting process are caught inside the equipment and they are either sucked out if they are light um, or they are also falling down, so they are not going up. And you can also collect the filling gases. If you cut a poison rod or an RCCA, you can also collect the filling product, uh, the, the filling gases inside the tubes of, for example, the RCCAs. So doing so, you can cut with a minimum impact of debris on your pool and uh, pool pollution. The equipment itself, uh, you can see it on the picture below, is rather lightweight and small. So it can be placed, I would say, almost everywhere if you do the necessary engineering judgments. The disc, which is cutting, can be adapted to your uh, core component configuration, like 17 by 17, 15 by 15, or also 18 by 18, 14 by 14, and so on. Um, what you can do while you are cutting, because the disc itself, it, it turns 90 degrees and then it turns back, you can choose the number of the cuts you are doing, you can choose it freely. You can either just cut all the fingers at once and they remain in full length, or you can cut extremely small pieces. What is also possible, depending on the interface we have in your plant, that you do not need extra equipment to handle the, the core component. You can approach 
the DC3, because it's so small and so flat, you can approach it with a refueling machine, which makes the disposal time, uh, which is reducing the disposal time because you can bring your core components just with a refueling machine into the DC3. Um, and you can also choose whether you, for example, during plant operation, when you do not have sufficient space in the pool, you put a canister on the storage rack, you put the DC3 on top of the canister, you cut down a bunch of RCCAs, reducing the confined space in the, in the pool, and then you take it away. Or on the other hand, you can also put the DC3 in rather huge and big equipments, uh, such like you can see here on the top right, where it is just this small to be seen here on the top. And then you send the material you are cutting directly into the disposal casks, just as one possibility. So from my perspective, this is the most interesting development for all customers, which have to treat somehow the disposal of core components. So, but what does all of what I have shown mean in total? It means we are not only developing single products, we are developing all our processes and products, starting from the sipping over inspection and repair and sampling to all kind of backend topics. And why are we doing it? We are doing it to be there for you. So I always say our product is not a, a, a single technology, it's our expertise itself leading to a good technology. And this expertise has been available for you since more than 30 years. And it will be, it is available now and it will be available in the future. So to shortly to say our product is expertise at all. Yeah, I hope it was not too exhausting at all. And I hope that uh, I had the chance to inspire you. So if you want more information, please feel free to contact me or to visit our webpage. You can easily find it under fueltraining.framatum.com. And on the webpage, you will find all the product portfolio. You will find free webinars, trainings, and our newest services and innovations. If, for instance, a little bit off topic of fuel service, but quite interesting. We are offering our latest software for nuclear core design and safety analysis, the Arcadia, as a cloud solution, which is called My Arcadia. So let's say welcome to the digital world of Framatome. And again, thank you for participating to this webinar. Many thanks also to the ENS for the perfect organization. And again, especially thanks to Emilia and Mattia for the support. So now the floor is open for questions. Yes, thank you very much, Thomas, for this fantastic presentation. It was very comprehensive. Uh, and uh, I have to say, I don't want to imagine, I don't know if you see my uh, paper clip, <laughs> how much <laughs> does it cost actually <laughs> to drop it by coincidence, actually. Uh, so thank you very much. It was very interesting story to follow with this uh, paper clip. Uh, we have really uh, participants from all over the world, from Brazil, from Japan, from different uh, from different parts of the region. Uh, almost 100 participants today and uh, already a lot of questions. We prepared some, but I think if we just uh, can go directly to the questions that are pressing uh, and set by the um, by the participants. And the first question is from Dr. Mohamed Hassan. Uh, would you please provide more information qualifying the additive manufacturer spaces? Um, this was presented on the slide number 10. Um, and regarding the Framatom tools and equipment for dealing with the defective, um, uh, are they part of the original design of Framatom exporter reactors or they are considered as a part of the fuel assemblies, of course, as a part of uh, operation maintenance services? I don't know if you, if you, uh, Thomas, you see the question in. Um, yeah, and maybe I, I just... you want to, you can stop sharing your screen. Then yeah, I, I stopped it. I, I can see the question. Ah, superb. Okay. So the question is coming from uh, Mr. Hassan. I, I, I can see it. Okay. For the for the additive manufacturing, if you, um, first of all, thank you for the question. Um, the, the additive manufacturing, the components we have used, um, the spacer clips, and the, the full spacer grid, which was applied to this boiling fuel assembly, for example, it was used for the final disposal. 
So if you want further information of these uh, additive, additive manufacturing spaces to be, to be uh, sorry, the camera is there, to be implemented into, um, into the fuel assembly for radiation, um, I need to forward you to uh, people from the fuel design. So uh, I understand your question more in this direction because you are asking for a radiation performance testing. So we have used it for final disposal where we do not have to qualify the irradiation itself. But Framatome is developing um, uh, additive manufacturing for, for um, fuel assembly components. So please send me an email and I will forward you to the responsible persons in the fuel design group to treat this question. Okay, second question regarding Framatome. Okay, the, uh, the Framatome tools for the defective fuel assemblies and fuel rods. We have two sets of equipment. I always call it, you need enablers and you need specified equipment for the speci specific fuel assembly. An enabler for me is that you have in the new build phase in the original design of the reactor, you have sufficient support platforms, elevators, a repair station, we call it RSR, um, uh, RSA, I'm sorry. Um, this is the enabler. You are in general able to treat defect fuel assemblies. When it comes to the specific topic like echo and so on, these are the specific tools. And the, these tools have either been um, sold to the customers afterwards, someone, um, or we are providing them on rental base. Um, it depends on your strategy, how much effort you want to put on equipment on yourself with uh, maintenance and so on, because whatever you, you buy, at the very beginning, when it becomes more complex, you need to maintain it. But the enablers, we always recommend to buy them. It is a, the, the mass zipping, the box zipping. It is the uh, multi-inspection facility, which is a, an XY table inspection stand. Um, and it is the um, fuel assembly repair station, beside many others like grippers and fuel handling and so on and so on. But when it comes to very specific tools, um, we have developed them further and further and further and further over time. I hope this answers your question. So to answer the question, our equipment is partly part of the original design of the reactors, what I call the enablers. And it is also um, part of mobile equipment we are providing right now. Okay, super. Very, uh, I think it is in clearly answered on these two questions. Now is this question from uh, Hiromasa Mia. Uh, with regard to the mobile box sipping with uh, heating, how high should we raise the temperature of the box inside in order to detect cesium? Um, the question of the temperature is we you do not need to raise the temperature too much. So you do not need to cook or to boil, almost boil the fuel assembly. In the past, there have been some developments and tests and, uh, and so on. Um, when somebody tried to heat up as much as possible to also do some prediction on how big is the defect and so on. So the, 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 the temperature you need is not so much. Okay, super. Martin uh, Kopetz, Kopetz uh, what is the training database of AI used for video processing? Is it adaptive? Is it designed towards geometrical changes or also on the surface color changes? Good, good, good question. Many answers. <laughs> the, um, this is what I said that the development of the artificial intelligence um, for, the, uh, for the video analysis online um, is going in different paths. So for me, it's not only artificial intelligence, it's also machine learning. And we are now combining different stuff because uh, sometimes it's more machine learning based on geometrical changes. And sometimes it's based on artificial intelligence, for example, to detect uh, specific differences. The, the, the database behind, the training database behind is your data. So what we need to do to apply the software in your plant, we need to know um, how you are processing your inspections 
what kind of camera system do you need? And then we apply the software in the right way. And also we need your safety case. If your safety case is, or let's say the, the, the what you want to get, if your target is you want um, a good documentation by um, putting all the pictures together to have a, a, a global view of the fuel assembly, this is more machine learning. If you want to have this debris detection as a safety case, it's more artificial intelligence. In any case, the more data we get from you, we can either check whether our machine learning code is good or we can train the AI. In the end, it's a combination of both. So I haven't answered the question because there is no 100% answer. So if you have further questions there, please just tell me. These surface color changes is just an interface tool. The question mm. is how you detect what is different. Okay. Um, maybe afterwards we can also share, Thomas, your, your contact details uh, for further for questions. Sure. Um, Andre Pasta, uh, I would like to ask if you know or can estimate how long it takes to damage the fuel cladding with a paper clip. Uh, as we saw at the beginning of your presentation, do you have any research activities regarding the the brief fretting phenomenon? Uh, I, I I cannot really um, I I cannot answer how long it took um, with the damage of this one fuel assembly. I remember the fuel assembly name, the customer, the situation, and also the year, but I do not know whether it was at the beginning of the cycle or at the end. I I cannot tell you. What we have is. Um, the, the fretting itself, um, we have analyzed a lot in the past, um, but we are not so much concentrating on how long does it take uh, until something has fretted through the cladding. The um, research activities in the frematome are going in the direction that we avoided at all. So we are enhancing the um, the uh, fuel guard, the, the debris filter at the bottom of the fuel assembly, we are enhancing the design, we are performing developments um, in, in, in France about what size of, um, of debris and which, am which amount can cause something and so on. But it's not so much about how fast is the fretting itself. What I can say is our experience of our contacts to all our customers is that because of the increased efficiency of these debris filters, the, 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 the fret, fretting incidents are getting less and less and less, and the, the debris itself is getting more and more smaller. I'm just putting in the chat uh, the contact details of you for the further questions and contact. And now I'm coming back to a question what was said by, ah, uh, already Albana did the same, uh, from uh, Rodriguez Roberto, Sebriano, uh, Rodriguez Sebriano Roberto. Um, is the mass sipping a spectrometric system? <laughs> yeah, I have to apologize. I'm an engineer. I am not a radiochemistry expert. What I can say here, and this is just a, a little bit poor knowledge about the, the mass sipping equipment on that case, we are using beta detection and not gamma detection. So we are sending the gas through two um, beta detectors, and then we do not get the peaks of specific um, energy levels of specific isotopes, we more get a smooth curve of the different contributions with different energy levels of the different isotopes. If you want a very detailed question, please send me an email. I will forward you to the Framatome expert for radiochemistry. We have two of them, um, one in Lyon and one in Erlangen, and they can really give you the expert answer on that. You have 16 molecular rates and Jean-Baptiste Doucet question, uh, could you please give us the UF6 team molecular ratio in the kiln during the production? I'm sorry, I do not understand the question. UF6, I understand. I understand steam molecular ratio, uh, yeah. but I do not so know maybe, what kiln is. Um, I will ask uh, Jean-Baptiste, are you able to um, activate your... Um, your camera, maybe uh, Mattia, if you could help me to handle uh, the camera, but also the the audio, if we can detect this because there are like over ninety people. But in the meantime, maybe we can also 
answer a question from uh, Juan. Could you tell us about Framatom's experience repairing fuel elements uh, whose integrity is in doubt, for example, that have a detached top nozzle? Yeah, uh, I can. Um, it's a rather seldom activity, for sure. Um, but we did that uh, several times in the past. Um, uh, you can imagine that I'm not allowed to give very much details on such topics here, um, but we have recently treated such fuel assembly uh, last year, and we did that several times in the past. What we have is we have uh, different technologies because you always have to separate case by case. Um, we are able to insert specific plugs to handle the fuel assembly without the top nozzle. We are able to put new top nozzles, or we are able to put a skeletons, external skeletons and other devices around the fuel assembly to treat it. So, so, so here we have the experience. We almost do this operation on an annual or almost all two years basis. But I need to know what exactly what kind of case you have. This is what I meant with the fuel assembly repair solutions. We have a lot of stuff, but we need more information from you to say, okay, here we would like to suggest this one. Okay, thank you, Jean-Baptiste. Please send an email. I tried to find the answer. Okay. Uh, Amaya rodriguez Sopena. she says that it's a very interesting presentation and she's asking if we can share the, the slides. Uh, after the after the webinar today, we will uh, put the recording on our YouTube uh, web where the presentation will be included. If you have specifically need for the slides, I think uh, it's better to contact directly uh, Thomas, and then he can decide uh, to to share to whom and and what exactly. Okay, uh, I don't see any further questions. I think we are in the end of the webinar. Uh, it's exactly three minutes to uh, to the full um, hour. So it, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I saw a lot of interest, a lot of uh, um, questions, and uh, I'm sure we will have also a lot of views afterwards also on our uh, YouTube channel. So we will share the link uh, afterwards with you, and uh, you can also share with your colleagues if you think there's of, of the interest uh, for today. Thank you very much, Thomas, for this fantastic presentation. Thank you very much to Alban as well for uh, helping us to set this up. And we are very much looking forward uh, to have you in the next editions of our webinars uh, on nuclear technology as such. So thank you very much for today and um, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.